In this video, we're going to talk about what is a set. So let's start off with the definition. A set is a collection of objects called elements. And sets are typically denoted using these curly braces on the outsides, or maybe I'll call them squiggly brackets throughout this video, and more of my videos if you watch them. So what's the intuition for what a set is? I want you to think of a set as a list. And there are some extra rules, a few extra rules in there, but just think of it as a list for right now. We'll talk about the extra rules as we go, maybe a little bit toward the end. But let's get started with an example. So let's take capital G to be squiggly brackets, so I'm gonna tell you about a set. And inside of there you've got apple, grape, and banana. So you can kind of notice that I've just separated the things uh, by a comma. I've separated those objects by a comma. And this is a set. So if I look back to the definition, what is the definition again? It's just a collection of objects, and we call those objects elements. So this is a set because the objects in the set are apple, grape, and banana. That's it. That's all we're checking for something to be a set. So really it's just a list that we've put inside of these curly braces for right now. And we'll look a little bit more at some another way to think about sets shortly. But it's a little bit of a mouthful to tell somebody apple is an element of the set G. And uh, part of what makes mathematics cool is it gives us um, some symbols to play with in order to, to write these down quickly in a way that, you know, as long as everyone knows what the symbol means, um, then everyone can understand it. So some notation here, the symbol E means is an element of. So we're gonna encode this symbol E with the phrase is an element of. So anytime you see that, you're thinking is an element of or some phrase synonymous with that. So let's put that into practice. So if I wanted to tell somebody that apple is an element of G, I would just say apple, little E thingy, G. And again, that's mathematics right there. Using symbols in order to communicate some ideas, even if they're not very complex. Uh, let's see, grape is an element of G, is what this little phrase says, and you probably guessed where I'm going with this. The last thing I'll tell you is banana is an element of G. Let's look at another example. So here I've got this boldface Z, and um, what have I done? I have listed out the positive and negative whole numbers in zero, and I notice now I should have a uh, little ellipses after the three to try to indicate that the pattern that you see continues where I'm still increasing to the right just by one unit at a time. Anyway, this might not be new to you. These are called the integers. And so all I'm saying now is I'm gonna think about this collection of numbers, numbers of this type, as the set of integers. Let's look at another example where you also see that a common way to denote sets is just by listing the elements in the set. So let's look at E down here, and you see that E looks kind of similar to Z above, where I'm just taking the even integers in this case. And yes, zero is even. So here E is the set of even integers. And what do we see about that? If I look a little bit more closely at them, there's maybe another condition that all of the numbers in that set satisfy. So in other words, I see that all the elements in the set could be defined as, tell me the integers that are divisible by two. And uh, I'm underlining the phrase defined as here because E consists of all the elements. So there are no other elements that are integers that are also divisible by two. They have to be in my list E. So that's what I mean by defined as this. And so what's, some, what's another notation for how do we talk about E, rather than just listing the elements? And the other common notation that you'll see more often in math books is set builder notation, and it's an alternative to listing. So I'm going to use E above in order to uh, show you what it looks like. So what I would say is E is equal to the following. It's how you should read this. The first little blurb says X is an integer. I'm gonna tell you about what the colon means next. That little colon is the phrase such that. So again, we're using a symbol to kind of encode a phrase here. And so think of the colon as such that, or that R, and I tried to color code these so that you could see above. So that R is what I'll use that for here. And then in orange, I see, I'm just gonna write two divides X. And you could put more mathematical symbols in there to, to denote that, like two with a vertical bar X is another way to denote that but I'm just trying to get across to you the structure for how do I translate that definition above um, into a statement about a set or a description of a set. And let me try to tell you about in general, what's the pattern kind of like for set builder notation. How you usually start is you say your, your set A, you notice we use capital letters a lot, A is equal to the following. So we throw our curly braces down and uh, the first thing we'll write down is what type of objects are in A. So if you refer to my example with E, I'm gonna tell you about some integers. Not necessarily all of them, but I'm gonna tell you about some integers that do something. 
The next thing you put down is the little colon. And again, colon means such that. And then to the right, oh, maybe I should say, an alternative to the colon there, um, some authors like to use a vertical line to separate the red from the orange, if you can see that. I'll use the colon for now, but you might catch me do a vertical line later on. Um, but then what goes to the right of the colon? To the right of the, col the colon is sort of the, con the, the defining condition of, uh, for, for an element to be an A. So like that's where, okay, I only want the integers that are divisible by two. And so that divisible by two is the defining condition in order for an integer to belong to E. Let's look at some more examples. So I'll scroll down a little bit. The set of real solutions to x squared minus one is, and like I'm thinking college algebra, like, oh, I'll solve that equation however I want. Maybe I factor, maybe I move one over and take the square root of both sides. I should get positive and negative one. And so just to communicate that idea a little bit differently, the set of real solutions is the set that has minus one and one in it. So just those two numbers are in that set there. And just for practice, how would I take this kind of listing form, or you might call it the roster method, when I'm just listing negative one and one, how do I write that in set builder notation above? We could also write A is the set of all real numbers. So that bold R is the typical notation for real numbers. But again, so I'm looking at all real numbers X, that's in red. The blue is such that, and then the orange is, what's the condition that X has to satisfy? And X has to satisfy that equation, X squared minus one equals zero. So again, that is another way to describe the set of real solutions to that particular equation. So just seeing how we could kind of describe something we know about using this, this new language of sets. A few more examples here. Um, oh, sorry, definition first. The empty set is a special set, and it's defined as the set with no elements. And there are two common notations for it. Sometimes people denote it just by curly brackets with nothing between them, like, you know, it's empty. Uh, and another more common one that I think I use more often is the circle with the slash through it. And you've probably seen that before at some point. So I typically do reserve the circle with the slash through it for the empty set and not for the number zero, like some people like to write. So that is going to denote the empty set. So let's look at an example. What if I think about x squared plus one equals zero? Well, I know that has no real solutions and then that's probably the first time you're introduced to the complex number i. But anyway, just to um, describe this particular situation using set theory, we can communicate this idea as the following. We could say all real numbers x, so that's what x and r says. Um, and then the colon is such that x squared plus one equals zero. So just to say that a little bit more cleanly, what does this say so far? all real numbers x such that x squared plus one equals zero, the set of all such numbers, is empty. And so we would just say that equals the empty set because there are no such numbers. So here are some other notes about what does it take to be a set or what are some um, common rules for when we're, we're describing elements in a set. And really there's two big ones. The order in which elements are listed in a set is not important. All that really matters is what are the objects in the set. So to give you an example of what I mean, the set with the three letters A, B, C, if I wrote them as B, C, A instead, it's the same set. I do not care what order you list them in. These are the same sets because they contain the same objects. Number two, elements in a set are not to be listed more than once. So to give you an example of what's going on there, what I've written down is the set of all real numbers such that x minus 2 times x minus 2 is equal to 0. And if you think about that equation to the right and think about what x makes that true, it's just 2. And what's very tempting for students to write at first is, oh, it happens twice. I'll write 2 twice. And what I'm saying is when you write it as a set, you do not need to list it twice. And you should not list it twice. So sets do not like repetition of elements.